Hello, good evening everyone, and welcome to the first live streaming of Ignite Seattle. Woo! Welcome, I'm your host, Victoria Thomas, and I'm here with Real Girls Pro, live at Town Hall Seattle. Ignite Seattle expect, accepts speech submissions from anyone with a story to share, challenging them to fit their passion into a five minute talk. Speechers who are selected and supported of fine tuning their talks, including expert speeders, expert speechers, and talks. Tonight, we get to hear from 12 amazing speakers presenting in a variety of topics ranging from gardening, smuggling, and shoes. It's gonna be a night. We are so excited we tuned in. Before the talks get started, I'd like to share a little bit with you about Real Girls. Real Girls is a production company who, produ who produces an institution that talks about talented students. Oh my gosh. Um, Real Girls empowers young women and young binary women filmmakers to take the first steps into their media making careers. All proceeds from our clients' projects go to support our classes and programs ages 9 to 19, um, which are offered on a pay-what-you-can basis. Tonight, we are lucky enough to work side Punch Drunk Productions broadcast this live. Thank you so much. We've got so many interesting talks tonight. Um, look forward to. Coming next, we hear um, friend of a foster child. How religion shaped me as a child. I like your shoes. Want to be friends. Dying black. Why we should teach kids to write fiction. Saving the planet with your fork. Wildlife gardening, turning orphanages into creative hubs, OCD family affair, how to see your own. Does this P value make your lies look good? And international. Now you may be wondering. We are so excited to hear from all of these talks tonight, and we're so glad that you guys tuned in tonight. Um, let's watch a quick video to see what is going to happen next. Thanks for tuning in. Cool. Ignite's a sprint talk, so it's five minutes. It's all the time you get. Ooh, Ignite is a bunch of people being brave and giving five-minute talks. What's your story? Ignite is validation of the idea that everybody has a story. And if they get a platform with a supportive community and some coaching, they can say something that can change people's lives. It is a quick inspirational talk. What does you say? How do you call it? Enlighten us, but make it quick. So Ignite is uh, five minute talks, uh, 20, slides per, 20 slides per talk, 15 seconds a slide, the slides auto advance. And I always think of Ignite Seattle being a very Seattle focused experience. Like you hear people are doing super interesting things in Seattle. And I think the audience is looking for that and wanting someone to stand up and say, I'm working on something that you've never heard about and I'm gonna blow your mind about how cool it is. Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm so excited to hear your talk tonight. So uh, we are here with Carlos Dillard, um, who's going to be talking about foster care. Is yes. that right? Um, could you tell us a little bit um, why you participated in this and experience and everything? Sure. So the name of my talk is A Friend of a Foster Child. The reason that I'm doing this Seattle Ignite 40 is because I feel like a lot of us have a lot of information on foster children, but we don't actually have a lot of information on foster adults. And with so many kids becoming adults, I think that we all need to educate ourselves on how to communicate and cohabitate with them. That's so true. 
that I'm glad you said that because I've also known so many kids in foster care who kids and exactly that, that's very we definitely we behave different than than at the average adult because we had a different childhood that's so true so um what do you hope the audience will take away from your speech I hope that the audience will take away just the simple just a simple fact of just listening um, I know my speech is called a friend of a foster child but really it should be a friend of anyone um, and you really should educate yourself communicate and listen when you're becoming a friend with anyone but when you're dealing with foster children you definitely have to be extra uh, attentive when it becomes building those friendships yeah very nice thank you thank you um, what would you say to any foster youth or any former foster youth any inspiration, what would you say to them dealing with this? You are your biggest fan. You are, no one's gonna, your mom's not gonna be there for you, your brother, your sister, the only person that's gonna be there for you for the rest of your life is you. So do what makes you happy and put yourself first. And I think in our world, putting yourself first is looked down upon, but I think a lot of foster children especially need to put themselves first because no one else put them first. So you definitely need to put yourself first, especially when you're an adult. So that I hope any foster child listening to me right now will just take that away. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to put yourself first. Thank you. Yeah, um, one more thing. So I heard a little bit about your talk before, and we know that your last name is Dillard. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And we know in your talk, you talk about a store that you went to. Is, yeah. is that, was there any connection to that? No, it was, it's, so I took my husband's last name. Um, so when I worked at that store, that wasn't my last name. But when I got married, it became my last name. So people at the job would actually, my name tag, they put Mr. Diller. And so all the customers were like, oh, you're Mr. Diller. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> just got married. But uh, yeah, people would make fun of it. But it has no connection. It's just coincidence. Well, thank just coincidence. you so much for talking with me. That was really nice. Thank you. Thank you. And I can't wait to see your speech. Thank you so yeah. much. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. All right, we will be back. Oh, one more. Oh, we will be back. Mary. Yes. Sorry, so much. We next we have Mary Pudi. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Hi. How are you? Great. Oh my gosh. Hold on. Sorry. Yes. It is. I mean, let me let me tell you. You look. Look so great. Okay, this red dress. You are doing oh, it. Yes. You. you are doing it. Hold well, on. I'm sorry. Well. Yes, we got this red thing going on. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. It's working. Okay. Um. Yes. So, why were you interested in participating in Ignite 40? Oh, wow. I've seen a few of these shows, and it's just such a fantastic way to get all different kinds of stories and different perspectives from so many different people and have an opportunity to learn and be a part of a community. Yes. Okay. okay, so I heard that. Is this your first night, or this is how many talks have you been to Ignite? about three. Three, okay. So this is the first This is the first, okay, the okay. Are you excited? Are you nervous? I'm super excited. Okay. I'm extremely nervous. Oh, okay. I like, you know, like really? Uh, agitation in my tummy. We are rooting for you. Thank here. you so much. <laughs> okay, so what do you hope the audience will take away from your speech? Well, it's about the connection between food and climate change. And I think a lot of people feel like climate change is this really, really huge issue that they don't know what to do about. And so my goal tonight is to give people some really simple, practical applications that they can take away and put into play in their normal day-to-day -day life. Yeah, come on. Nice, yes. Just trying to change the world, Victoria. Okay. Just trying to change the yes. world. Okay, I see you. I see you. I see you. Um, let's see. How did you draw the connection between nutrients and climate change? So there's a huge uh, connection between nutrition and what we eat and what the climate is currently doing right now. And we have a huge, I mean, I'm not drawing the connection. I'm a dietitian nutritionist, so I work with food all the time. I talk with people about food all the time. I think about food all the time. I love food myself. So I know that we've got an opportunity to do something every single day, three times a day, if not more. Um, and, and, and sometimes individuals are the people who are going to start the change and actually make the world a better place. Thank Thank you. Yes, I, I agree. I definitely agree. So um, I'm so excited to see your speech. Um, I can't wait. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about or say about your speech or just tell us a sneak peek? 
Ooh. Well, um, oh gosh, that's the I, I, it's sneak peek. I mean, I think it's the the thing that I just want people to know is that no one has to be vegan. It, this is not about you suddenly becoming somebody that you're not, right? You don't have to be a different person. You just have to be willing to make a few changes. But like, we got to change. Like, you know, we're not taking showers as long as we as, as we used to, and like, that's too damn bad. Like, we got to do something about this. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Thank you so much. For Thank you with me. Um, Good luck on your speech. Thank you. Good luck with the rest of the show. Thank you. All right. Bye. And we will see you after the break. Thank you. After the video. My name is Sharon Cronin, and I'm a founding member of Grupo Bayana. It started back many years ago when we would just dance socially. So we would dance salsa, we would dance soca, we would dance our social dances. But whenever we got together at community events, we would always end up doing some kind of group performance thing together just for fun. We started out with the social dances, but as we learned more about them, we wanted to know about their roots, and that brought us to the traditional dances of the Caribbean. And so each of those dances has their own roots. All of them have roots in West Africa with indigenous influences from those different island nations. So we'll see that there are similarities among the dances, but each one has its own unique character. My name is Reynaldo Rosario. I'm a drummer, a singer, dancer, whatever I have to do during the performance. So normally what happens in Bomba is that the dancers would be uh, you know, dancing to, to, to the beat, to the rhythm, to the song that is playing, and I would kind of like translate it onto the drum. As an artist, and I feel like every artist has, a, has this responsibility. They have to give back to the community that gave to them. So uh, not to forget where you came from and how you came up, right? My name is Yvonne Yoakum, and I am a percussionist for Google Bayana. I first got into Moko Jumbies last year, summer of 2017. The history of Moko Jumbies originates in West Africa and moved to the Caribbean in times of slavery. And they used to walk on stilts for their ancestors and to be uplifted or upright. What motivates me to keep going is the people and how their reactions and just like when someone sees me doing stilts or playing um, bomba, they like feel like, dang, this, this person's so young and doing like things that grown people can't even do, you know. My favorite part of performing is to see people, like their eyes glowing and stuff and like people, how they enjoy the music and get inspired. As we go into the future, I'd like to see the Guayano continue to be there for community members that would like to join and want to learn. We've gone into schools and presented and have children come up and say, I want to be, I want to do that, can I do that? We have members that that's how they became a part of our group. In the fourth grade, when we were at their school, come out and joined us. And Grupo Guayano, and we also view ourselves as cultural workers. That means that it's our job to continue the cultural art forms that we learn from our ancestors and the elders in our communities. But it also means that we're here to serve community. We're here to serve when there's a child being celebrated for their birthday. We're here to serve when there is somebody that's having celebrating. So we'd like to continue that, to be there for community, to be able to be a mirror, a place where people can see themselves. And also, for Moko Jumbies, we'd love to see more people join and have a larger group of Moko Jumbies available here in Seattle to share and to exchange in parades and in community events. So that idea, uh, wherever people are, as long as they are doing cultural work, then Grupo Bayano continues. Hello, and we're back. Hi. Hi, I'm Aridin. My co-horse. How you doing, girl? Pretty good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. I was just so happy and excited to see that amazing video we just watched. I mean, that was credits to real girls right there. That's quality work, okay? Um, 
Fun fact, I was actually a part of that video and um, we, we do these videos every summer and we work with different clients and we help them produce videos like that and so it was really amazing working with them. So how, what have you done with Real Girls that you're excited or happy to share about? I mean this this has been pretty fun so far like yeah. the planning and uh, kind of figuring out all that's going to go into it and like yeah, yeah. it's going to be fun hearing about all these people's interesting things they got to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've done I've done some other stuff with Real Girls too. Yeah. Like uh, like I helped shoot this thing for uh, safety Seattle safety. Mm. Oh, yeah, I don't remember. But I helped shoot that, so okay, that was fun. Okay, okay, I see you, I see you. That's what's up. It was crazy to me when I saw them on those stilts because I was actually behind them and I felt like they were going to follow me, but they didn't. <laughs> I was happy they didn't. It was crazy, but it was really amazing to see how much powerful work Real Girls does, and I'm so excited to always be a part of their, their process and their planning. Um, they really help women especially like myself become really empowered because it really teaches you to stand up for yourself and just especially in this industry they it's a really a male dominated like industry and it's really hard to like be confident when there's so many men around and I'm so glad that real girls exist for that to help women feel really confident so it also like programs like real girls and the like the video we just watched kind of helps you get re-touched with your culture you know yes, the culture yes. that was like kind of stolen from yes, us and yes. especially about the video we watched it, okay. it really helps yes it does yes thank you so much um next we have Nicole thank you Aridin thank you <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah? You go up soon? Uh, oh. Well, oh. I'm here soon, here but I, soon. I get to hear the speaker yes, soon. Yeah, soon. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, um, so let me just introduce you real okay. quick. Sorry, my iPad is all over the place. No worries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, why were you interested? Hold on. Sorry. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. So, what's your name? Tell us your name. Sure. My name is Nicole Steinbach. I think I saw it. You saw it? Yeah. Where did um, you see it? Just going up a little bit. Um, what your experience with Ignite Seattle is. And, sure. Yeah. I gave my first Ignite talk back in 2010. Okay. It was on 22-minute meetings. Okay. And it was very successful, wow. and I had so much fun. Yeah. Um, Scott Birkin, our speaker coach, mm. encouraged me to give the talk. And then flash forward seven years, I still yeah. was coming to Ignite Seattle a lot and wanted to get more involved, so I volunteered wow. as an organizer. That's amazing. Yeah. So what, what brings you back every year? Is it the people? Uh, the well, what brought me initially was mm -hmm. I just love the night. So it's yes. so fun. There's yes. so many speakers. They talk about different things, and it's just such a great exp Seattle yes. experience. Yes. And then what keeps me volunteering are the amazing people that I get to work with all the time. Yes. So it's just a fun group. Yes. And so it's work, it's volunteer work, mm -hmm. but I do it for free because it's just so fun and I yeah. believe in Ignite Seattle. Definitely. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. I mean, just looking at this crowd, you just see yeah. how much support you guys yeah. have and everyone yeah. has here. It's really fun. Um, could you tell us, so... Let's see. What is the process to prepare for speaking at night? What do you do? You know anything? Well, yeah. The first thing you have to do is submit your talk. Yeah. So we get over seventy submissions each time. Okay. And we have this very um, great process that we use to narrow it down to twelve talks. Okay. And so then we tell speakers that they've been selected. Okay. And then it's time to prepare. We wow. help them to prepare by giving a first coaching session, where we. You come and Scott Birkin, our speaking coach, gives an overview mm. on, you know, things to know about public speaking, mm -hmm. things to know about an egg Seattle. And then we have people come up and what we do, dry runs. Mm. So this is stand up for five minutes and talk yes. talk about your subject. 
You, no preparations required. And it's yes. encouraged that you talk through your, your talk before you jump into doing right. the slides. Exactly. The slides are a very important part of it, but you want to know what you're going to say before you start mm. like fiddling with PowerPoint. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And before we go, can you tell us just why this is important for people to do and why why should they come and join the Night Seattle? Yeah, why well, I think for the people on stage, they get to share their story mm -hmm. and their message and their life experience with others and positively impact other people's lives. And then being in the audience, you're having fun, it's entertaining, yes. you get to connect with people, and you might learn about something mm -hmm. or someone yes. that could literally change your life. Yes. We've had life changes yes. at Night, Ignite Seattle, and so that's yes. really exciting. Okay, well, thank you so much you're for so talking. Welcome. With me. This was yes. fun. Yay. Very fun. I love your shoes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now thank we're... you so much. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are what you? What is your name? My name is Madeline. Oops, I'm, uh, I'm Scott. 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 Nice to meet you. Uh, I had a family friend who okay. had an extra ticket and she said, Do you want to come? And I okay. said, Yeah. Okay. So a couple years ago, some work friends brought me along. And so. Yeah for the, like the last two years, we've tried to make it to a couple of nights a year. So, okay, okay, yeah. I see you wearing the Seahawks. You come am, from the game. Yeah, I think they're playing right yeah, now, so they, yeah. You know if they won or not? Uh, I think it's halftime, half and we're up by okay, one. Okay, okay, so, you gonna yeah. sneak over there after this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> nice, nice, <laughs> nice. Sure. So, um, sorry. What are you looking forward to most about tonight? Um, I'm looking forward to the different and like the array of speakers that you guys have, especially the one about I think it's called like how your fork can help the environment. And yes, I'm really curious. I yes, think it's going to be about too. veganism, but yes. like I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I always like pick one talk that excites me. So like the p-value talk. Yeah. Um, I'm interested. I'm a techie, yeah. so I'm interested in that. But honestly, the ones that I usually have no idea about, like those mm. are the ones that. I always walk away like learning more. Um, okay. Yeah, so okay, I'm just that's what's up. Yeah. Be excited. yeah. Have you guys ever done a talk like this before? No, or have you I, ever? Like, I have never. No, I've never no, given a, never a given talk a like speech? this. Okay, yeah. this is cool. I guess I had to for my thesis yeah. like, in my master's program, but yeah. it was like only maybe ten people in the audience, so mm. nothing this large. Okay, that's what yeah. I love your earrings. By the oh, way. thank I you. I've been at them this whole time. Okay. Um. So, where are you guys from? Are you originally from Seattle? Uh, I'm from you, Ohio. You're from Ohio? Yeah, I've lived in the area for like five years, though. Nice, so. nice. What about you? And I'm from Boston. From Boston? I just moved here okay. two months ago. How you like in Seattle so far? It's nice. It's, it's nice. cold, though. It <laughs> is, though. I be shivering at night. I'm like, um, yeah, it's really yeah, cold. It you is. don't have to shovel the rain. Oh, so. yeah, that's I know. True. That's, that's true. true. <laughs> but when we get that one, it just snow. We are happy, though. <laughs> no school, no work, no yeah, nothing. Everything shuts down. Yes, right. yes. So I can look forward exactly. to that. Yes. Okay. Huh. What else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we already touched about this. Um, what brought you here? Why'd you come? Um, would you ever like do an night talk like this in the future if you had the opportunity or? I, I think so. Yeah, think I have so? some ideas for some talks that I, I would I could give. So yeah, yeah well, I think next it, time I'll submit. Yeah. Uh, so over the last couple of years, I've gotten into like some triathlon okay. events, um, and so those are really like tough physically and mentally. Mm. And I've learned just an absolute okay. like a lot about That's triathlon. Nice. So yeah. I think I could give like a interesting talk around that. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what's true. What about you? Um, I guess I could talk about like I'm, my culture is Polish, so maybe okay. do something about being Polish in Vancouver yeah. and like that's where I used to live. Okay. Um, maybe something like that. But I'm not really great at public speaking, yeah. so it's not really the first I mean, thing I'd want to do. Great. So I mean, yeah, that's what's up. That's <laughs> well, really you. interesting. I feel like people would love to hear about like culture and stuff like that. I feel like I would be. Cool. But Thank yeah. You. Um, do you have any last minute words or things you want to say to the camera about you're excited no, just, or anything? Yeah, just really excited and can't yeah. wait for the show nice. to start. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're excited here. to have really you guys. Excited. Thank you so much thank for you. talking with me. Yeah. Hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yes. All right. Well, that was amazing talking to um, these lovely guests, huh? Um, <clears throat> That's it. I mean, we will see you after the break.
Hello, hello, Ignite Seattle. Woo -woo. Okay, two important things before we get started. Number one, I heard you guys like to cheer a lot, so I'm really into that. Yeah. Second thing, I'm your guest MC tonight. My name is Rovina. I did Ignite last October, so about a year ago. Um, you'll get to know a little bit more about me as we go through the show, because that's what keeps it fun. But the most important thing you should know is always in J's. I'll explain that later. Um, OK, so for you guys, whose time is it their first Ignite? If it's your first Ignite, can you raise your hand? OK. I have a secret announcement for you. You've probably been lied to. This will not be a good night, but it will be a great night. Because the energy of all of our speakers is something that cannot be matched. So I just want you to already get excited for whatever you thought would happen, like times 10. That's what will happen. And so who's been here two Ignites? Three, four, five, OK. Beyond numbers, I can count. So Ignite has been going on for 10 years, so that's a lot of Ignites. So we're here for Ignite Seattle number 40. Uh, yeah. 40 is a big year. My sister turned 40 this year. People celebrate being 40, so this is kind of like a birthday type thing happening. So thanks for coming to our party um, tonight for Ignite 40. Um, so now that we kind of went through the basic introductions, I want to make sure everybody's energy is high, which we have done that. But I have just one ask. We have this empty seat right here in the front row. And that kind of makes me sad. So. This little period is about me. So if anybody runs up here and sits in the front, you get two free drink tickets. Oh, hey. Um, I feel like she knew about that. That was crazy. I swear I don't know this woman. That just happened. That was amazing. Um, so all you first time igniters, Tip, that happens at every Ignite, so sit near but not front and you can win every time. Maybe that's what you did, don't tell me, I don't wanna know, um, but enjoy those drink tickets. All right, so I think I'm super excited to just get us right into the show here. Um, so the first thing we'll really talk about is what is Ignite? It's really an opportunity for us to see the power of storytelling through generations, through diverse schools of thought. There's always a unique truth, a unique story that you can share about yourself, about your experiences that other people can relate to. The coolest thing about Ignite, as we talked about, is you guys. This audience is very engaged. It's a super fun format. We'll talk more about it, but it's really an opportunity to think and learn about brand new things. The topics that you'll hear will be a diverse range, but the mission of Ignite is to really use that diversity as an opportunity to share and connect other people. So hopefully you'll hear something tonight that really connects with you. And there's, there'll be a range of things you hear. We have scientists, you know, we have people that are hilarious, people that might bring you to tears. And so what we ask from every person here is to engage with what you want to engage with, plug out of something you don't want to tune into. So really respond the way you want. We have 12 amazing topics tonight. Anyone can submit a talk, and then we sit and we pick the best ones that we curate just for you guys. So this is a special group. These are the talks. No need to read this font. They'll be coming live, and I'll make sure you know the titles. So the important thing is the format. So each talk has 20 slides. Each slide is for 15 seconds. They automatically rotate, and it's for five minutes. So once those slides start going, they feel it. They know what number slide this is. And I may make this look easy because I've done it before, but just make sure that you award and congratulate and encourage our speakers as they come up and really do this. There's a range of experience. For some people, it's their first time. For others, it could be hundreds. But remember the power of this audience. And then remember the power of this incredible place that we're in right now. Welcome to Town Hall Seattle. The building was actually recently renovated. So for my, for my Ignite, I didn't get to be here. So I feel super excited to be on this particular stage tonight. Um, and for those of your friends or family members who couldn't be here, we do broadcast live streamed 
all over the planet Earth, as long as you can get Wi-Fi or 5G. Um, so check out igniteseattle.com slash streaming. Again, my name is Rovina. Excited to be your guest MC. This is only the second time we've had a guest MC. So if I do well, maybe they'll keep it up. Um, we don't know. But feel free to um, just make sure. Yeah, exactly. So tonight's program, we'll have six incredible talks each five minutes, about a 20-minute intermission with drinks and snacks, and then six more talks. So that's the flow. It'll go by really fast, but it'll be very deep, and you'll reflect, and you'll want to talk about that. So what's better than an after party, right? But in Seattle, I know, if you had to leave the building, you probably would skip it. So the after party here is downstairs at the auto bar. Stay. Don't put your coat on. Don't get out your umbrella. We're here. And then if you want to participate, you can do that a few ways. One, get a ticket to the next night. It's happening on February 27th, and tickets are on sale now. You get a special 20% off if you get tickets today. Another way to participate is share your own story. Anyone can submit a talk, and that's how you get the opportunity to be up here and participate. And come hang out with the best audience you will ever experience in a night in Seattle. The last, or a couple other ideas, is to really volunteer. So tons of volunteers help Ignite go, help it run every quarter, but really they're working every day. There's a lot of preparation. So feel free to figure out how you want to help out, tearing tickets or you know whatever your talent may be, photography, et cetera. These are a couple of folks who have helped organize Ignite Seattle this, this time around. So special thanks to everyone here. I won't read these names. You guys are awesome. And we also want to give awesome, awesome thank yous to the sponsors. So for that live stream happening all over the earth, we have Punch Drunk who does that, but also records the talks. Each of the speakers here tonight, their talk will go up and be available on YouTube. Plug for mine, it's also available. Thanks to you guys. Um, we also have Mind Hatch, who has been a great contributor to Ignite Seattle. And they really help businesses move forward and transition and operate better through design thinking and innovation and some really great services to help take business to the next level. Culture 4, we're excited to tell you guys we want a grant from Culture 4. Um, and they do a lot of funding for cultural work, specifically in King County. So really nice to be connected to local Seattle uh, businesses and have them really acknowledge some of the great work that Ignite is doing. So without further ado, guys, that was your first Ignite Talk, five minutes. We did that. Mostly on time. If I wasn't on time, would I let you guys know? No, I wouldn't. Um, so let's go ahead and kind of get tonight's show started. Super excited to introduce our first speaker. Always the most fun job is to like kick it off. And then everyone else's job is to keep kicking it off. Uh, so it never ends. Uh, so our first speaker, very excited to have him. Here we go, friend of a foster child. Super excited. Please welcome Carlos Zillard. So by the time that this photo was taken, I had been in 30 foster homes, I had been molested, and I had been raped, and I had also attempted to take my life by suicide. I didn't know it then, but that smile and my personality would help me out in way more than I knew. As you guys can probably tell, my life didn't always start out that sad. My parents worked really hard to provide for their growing family. But like most people in the inner cities of Detroit, they fell victim to the crack epidemic. And with that being said, my sister and my brothers and I were put into the foster care system. With over 400,000 kids in the foster care system, many of you will eventually meet, marry, employ, or become a friend of a foster child. Many foster children like myself suffer from PTSD, anxiety, and a multitude of other mental illnesses. But knowing that, shouldn't we all learn how to communicate with them? When I was 16 years old, I became homeless, but I was not hopeless. I knew that I had to obtain my GED so I can get a full-time job, and getting a job wasn't the hard part. The hard part was keeping a job. <laughs> By the time I was 20 years old, I had already worked a dozen jobs. And, <laughs> and the problem was my issue with authority and my issues rooting from foster care. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was lashing out at the customers. I was lashing out at my managers. That was until I got a job at Dillard's. That's where I met Crystal and Mavis. 
they were the first people who held me accountable for my actions, but then also made sure that it was okay that I knew it was okay that I was behaving that way. Instead of lashing out, they taught me to actually put my energy towards something productive like my sales goals. I remember one time, my first time actually, I lashed out at Crystal. She told me to gather my things and I was for sure it was gonna be number 21 um, on that job list, but she didn't fire me. Instead, she asked me why. Why did you behave that way? No one else had ever asked me why. I told her about my time in foster care and she and Mavis took the time to communicate with me. By the time I left Dillard's, I was this top salesperson, all because Mavis and Crystal took the time to communicate and to listen. All I ever wanted was a family of my own. And when I was young, that led me to be in very dangerous relationships. I found myself in the same type of relationships that I had seen growing up, just very dangerous and very non-good. Um, that was until I took some time to love myself and then I met Christopher. We met on an online dating site and we moved in within about a month of meeting each other. I trusted him because he could actually listen and I could give him all of my concerns and he actually understood. Like most couples, we've had our ups and downs. You know, we've even ended up on divorce court. <laughs> but unlike, other mo unlike most couples, Christopher had to learn how to deal with a partner who has PTSD, and more importantly, how to communicate with them. I'm coming, I asked Christopher one time, how did he deal with my personality disorder? He says, the more that he understood my childhood, the better he could actually communicate me as an adult. So in other way, other way he talked to me, he learned about my time in foster care and realized that I did not have a normal childhood, therefore I would not have a normal adulthood. We're coming up on our eighth year anniversary and I just wanna take these couple seconds to say I love you, babe. With that being said, you guys can probably guess that I have a hard time building friendships. Jumping from foster home to foster home, it was very hard for me to understand how to build sustainable relationships. I find myself wanting to be in control. I find myself having extreme anxiety and that leads to self-sabotage and burn bridges. This one's really hard for me. I've lost a lot of friends. Um, I burn a lot of bridges because of my attitude and because of my way of not communicating with my friends. These are the friends I've lost because of that. I had to learn how to not let foster care affect my current life. And that was very hard because most foster children like myself, we do suffer from anxiety and severe trauma that was caused from foster care. This is an example of what a, a text message would look like from me. I take holidays and my birthday very seriously because those are things that I never got as a child. So when someone flakes or no-show, I actually take it personal and it brings me back to that seven-year-old kid that no one wanted. I experienced new foster homes, new people, new religions, new everything. And at first I thought that that was a bad thing. But as an adult, I've learned to use those skills so I can take those things I've learned to build my new friendships. Foster care is not a bad thing, it's a learning opportunity. In the end, foster adults are just like you and I, just like you guys, you know? We've just had different life experiences. The only thing you have to do to become a friend of a foster child is to listen and to learn how to communicate. But that should be easy because you guys should be doing that with everyone anyways. Right? Thank you so much. Woo! That was awesome. Way to go. First of all, I hope that we all, you know, take our friendships more seriously and take the time to get to know other people. Um, backstories tell a lot about the present story. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, up next, we'll jump into some science, right? Uh, I used to watch Bill Nye the Science Guy, do all kinds of nerdy things. That's my life again, which you'll just keep learning about. Uh, so tonight, though, we're going to learn about another life, um, how religion has shaped me as a scientist. Can you guys give a warm round of applause for foe? My connection to Buddhism started from birth. My parents named me Fo Shen. The meaning of the Chinese characters translates to Buddha born. Do they expect me to lead humankind to enlightenment? <laughs> Perhaps. My hometown is in Kaohsiung, south of Taiwan. The building behind the tree you see is where I grew up. In it, things are modest, except the top floor was transformed into an elaborate altar with Buddha statues covered in gold. As a kid, 
my mom would force me to meditate with the Buddha for one instance time. I remember wanting to go play outside instead so that I would attempt to break the incense in half <laughs> and relight it. <laughs> I was clever. My mom would also bring me to retreats at the monastery. And at age seven, I voluntarily took out monkhood. My personal choice was granted, but later everyone said I was too young to know what was happening. So here I am. <laughs> Nevertheless, I did take the monk vow on the five precepts. And to this day, I still feel obliged to abide by these principles. But the one that I struggle the most with is no killing. And that has to do with me being a scientist. I came to the States at age 11 and found a passion for science with a degree in microbiology from UW. I'm fascinated by microbes that are living around us and with us. And their existence is why I have a PhD. Mouse is an animal model that I avoid at all costs because I do not want to break my vow of no killing. Microbes are an exception, though. They're so tiny. <laughs> you, you can't even see them with the naked eye and show no emotions, or so I believe. So for the past decade, I've been working with them to see how they cause human diseases. In my experiments, I would take human cells and bacteria, put them together, and observe how our cells respond to bacterial attack. It was like watching the battle unfold. And it was enlightening to see their interactions under the microscope. Who won? Human or bacteria? I would repeat this type of experiment until a pattern was found. But on one unremarkable day, something hit me. That day, I spread ethanol and bleach around my workspace and my hands to remove any lasting contaminants. I felt the movement so routine. I noticed the waste that I had generated that day and thought, did I do all that? I felt guilty. I felt guilty because I became indifferent, and I was simply doing it as a means to an end. Then I peeked into the microscope that day and remember thinking, those tiny creatures are moving, like living beings, like us. And in the flash, it brought me back to the time when I lived in the monastery, praying for both form and formless life. The exercise serves as a reminder that all life is precious. And that day forward, I started to question my conduct as a scientist. Is my act of killing cells justify in the name of science? Looking deeper into the question, I realized that consciousness is everywhere, even at the microscopic level. And I could no longer ignore this fact. Who was I to decide that one being was more important than another? But I could start somewhere by being mindful of how I handle them, for having appreciation for them being in my experiments, for allowing me to make discoveries and bring me closer to understanding the complexity of life. I still struggle. As a scientist, I'm naturally data-driven. My mood follows the waves of positive and negative results. <laughs> but if I allow myself to pause and examine my actions like a monk, then I gain greater clarity for my responsibilities and purpose in science. The little monk me would never have guessed I would be a scientist today, struggling with the first precept. It is an evolving journey for me as I continue to strike a balance between my ethics and actions, guided by constant reflection. Today, I have changed my approach in the lab based on what I call the five precepts as a scientist. I can't avoid causing harm to those tiny creatures that I work with, but I can treat them with respect. As for the rest of the precepts, they play an equally important role in reminding me to act generously and responsibly toward my peers, to tell the truth about the data, to stay lucid, to be creative. This talk is not so much about me as it is about my mom. She gave me my name. A few years ago, she was fully ordained as a Buddhist nun. She's not my teacher who constantly reminds me to show compassion to, for all life. She's more fitting to bear the name Buddha born. For now, my name is Phil, and I'm a scientist. Oh, for sure. Phil, that was awesome.
That was pretty cool. Science has always been cool, but when you hear science and emotion and you're like, oh, there are people doing that. That was very awesome. <laughs> uh, earlier I told you guys about my sneakers. That's like a good way to start a chat with me. Our next speaker is gonna maybe talk about that approach. We have the talk titled, I like your shoes. Wanna be friends? Please welcome Nadine Curry. Do you remember how easy it was to make friends when we were kids? You'd play with the closest person to you on the playground, and that was it. You were best friends forever, or for the day at least. But when's the last time that you made a new friend? For me, I was at this networking event, and I see this woman, and she's wearing these shoes, and they're the same ones that my best friend used to wear. It was a sign. I had to meet this person. I had to become their friend. So I took a leap of faith, and I went up to her. I like your shoes. Want to be friends? And friendships really are, you know, taking a leap of faith. And especially, you know, considering how busy we all are, friendships sometimes they take a back seat to all these other relationships that are part of our lives. You know, you're always in the middle of one plan, trying to make another one. And for me, I really want to make friendships more of a priority and try to learn from kids on why it comes so naturally to them. You know, I lived in one place for a really long time, but then I moved to three cities in three years. So I had to learn how to make friends really fast, and this is what I learned. So first, what is a friend? A friend is someone that you enjoy spending time with, someone that you, you like, someone that you can enjoy talking to. And the average American claims that they have five friends, but the last friend that they made was five years ago. And it could have been when you were a kid, so making friends as a kid was very simple, and you could tell how hard it's gotten when you compare birthday invites from when you were eight to now. <laughs> Can you imagine inviting like 60 people to your birthday this year? And when you were a teenager, it was about support and intimacy because no one else understood you at that age. And then if you were privileged enough to go to college, that's when you went out with your friends to find yourself or find a future partner. And then in your mid-20s, maybe you found that future partner and stopped seeing your friends. But really, friendships like, or just at least your personal network could peak at the age of 25, and your priorities change as you enter your 30s. Your wedding could be like an expensive way to tell your friends, I'm not gonna see you for a little bit. <laughs> but something changes in your life at some point. You move to a new city, like I did, you know? What do you do? Don't go to a networking event. <laughs> Try these three tips instead. So first tip. Become friends with yourself, really. It's cliche to say that you have to love yourself, but that just really means being comfortable and accepting who you are. So take a second to think about where you're at in life, and you know, maybe you just moved to Seattle, or maybe you've lived here and know what the city's like without traffic, but <laughs> the thing is you really have to take time and figure out where you're at before you can open up and meet new people. So. Go out and enjoy the things that you like to do. Go to the movies, go have dinner. For me, it was take, like going for runs by the water and then that turned into going on hikes. So that leads me to tip number two. Revisit the hobbies that you used to enjoy when you were a kid. What did you like to do? Did you join team sports? Did you go swimming? How did you excite yourself when you were younger? And you know, think about those things. For, for me, the sports that I used to play were volleyball when I was a kid. So every city that I would move to, I would join a team. And that led me to meet people that I would see week over week, and that's it. You know, we ended up becoming friends and ended up going on those hikes that I used to go on alone together. And then step outside of your comfort zone. Do something that you really never thought that you would do. For me, that was climbing. I grew up in the desert, so climbing mountains was not something I ever thought that I would do, but I ended up meeting really cool people that are open to trying new things. And tip number three, you have to be open and vulnerable. Kids are social because they care, they share, and they compliment each other. So take a second, show that you care. Maybe help someone out. And kids, you know, they're taught to share. And so invite an acquaintance over for dinner someday. There's um, actually a friend of mine who's here. When I first met her, she invited me to a murder mystery dinner at her place. I was shocked. Someone in Seattle was inviting me to their home. <laughs> but 
she's a friend and she's here today, so that's great. And lastly, compliment other people. I mean, it's such a, it gives you like a positivity boost and if you're genuine and authentic about it, it blitz trust. And everyone likes to hear nice things about themselves. So what happened to the woman whose shoes that I liked? Are we best friends now? No. <laughs> But I ended up putting myself out there and I met really, really cool people who are sitting here tonight. So thank you. <laughs> so thank you for joining me on this friendship journey and check out the community that I'm building with one of my friends here and really hope to see you all there. Bye. <laughs>
Stress affects the body, as we can see, through the brain, our cardiovascular system. And when we think about stress, we don't typically think that it can kill us. We also fail to recognize the correlation of mortality rates to racism. This depicts Emmett Till, Lee Thompson Young, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, and so many lives, too many lives that we have lost from racism, oppression, stress, that takes an immense toll on our body that is killing us sooner than should be expected. This year alone, my Aunt Lynn passed away. She was just 54 when she took her last breath. My Uncle Kenny, 52, when he died alone, traveling to another state in search of work and health insurance in an attempt to prevent the inevitable. My cousin, Aaron Montgomery, was just 34 when he took his last breath. And the world mourned the loss of Hermius Nipsey Hussle, who was slain in the same way so many black boys who look like him have died before. John Singleton was just 51 when he took his last breath. He died from a stroke, the same thing that killed my grandmother at 62. The leading cause for strokes is high blood pressure. High blood pressure is related to stress. See the correlation? Adverse childhood experiences are especially insidious. And through what we call ACEs, we can now measure the impact of childhood toxic stress. You get one point for each type of trauma that you have. The higher your ACE score, the higher your risk for cardiovascular disease, and the higher your risk for higher mortality rates. The closer you get to having six or more, as we can see here, it decreases your lifespan by 20 years. Blacks all across the globe tend to have higher ACE scores, resulting in dying younger. And I see this every day. Just last week, I had a black man on my caseload who was 34, also like my cousin, who passed away from cardiac concerns, also like my uncle, who passed away from a heart attack. I want us to live better so we can die well. Awesome talk, Ashley. As you can see, the audience loved it. The slides are extra. We ignore those. There was a lot of great facts in there, and um, that was a super powerful story to kind of reflect on and think about. Um, in the spirit of truly understanding science and learning, uh, we have a, a very fun talk um, coming up and really thinking about starting with children, right? And why should we teach kids to write fiction? So please help me welcome Rebecca Dimmerist. So I'm gonna start you off with some dreaded audience participation. I want a show of hands if you have ever written a fiction story or thought about writing a fiction story ever in your life. Yeah, that's like, that's, that's, ev that's every, just about everybody. That's awesome, all right. Um, well, I also want you to think back to your school career and how many times did you actually get to write a fiction story? Not very much. Most of the time you're writing essays, you're writing book reports, you're doing math sometimes. Um, but <laughs> what we really like to uh, do is at the... Uh, what I'd like to say is I spend a lot of my free time teaching kids to write fiction at the Greater Seattle Bureau of Fearless Ideas, or the BFI. <laughs> Woo! Love people who know that place. It's a great place. And uh, we like to emphasize three things for the kids while they're learning to write fiction. The first part about it is uh, changing their perspective. Changing their perspective on people, changing their perspective on the world. We like to teach them creative problem solving. And uh, most importantly, we like to teach them a growth mindset. Now, when I say we're changing perspective, downstairs in the lobby, uh, we have an activity that some of you participated in where we have a genre matrix where we're trying to map our favorite books onto uh, scales of future to past, science to magic. And this is something I walk the kids through every summer when I teach my sci-fi and fantasy workshop. What we, this likes to do is it takes books out of their silos that bookstores and libraries put them in and say, hey, 
all the books are related to each other. They all sort of have this thing going on, and your stories can be wherever you want them to be. And that way, they can start to think outside the box. They can start thinking about where their characters are coming from. Why are they acting the way they're acting? Why is the bad guy a bad guy? Which then leads them to think, why is the bully a bully? Why is my boss acting that way? Who had a really bad day? And so it really helps the kids learn to get along better with their peers and in relation to that, as an adult, get along better with other adults and even their own kids. This leads into creative problem solving. So kids really like to put themselves in their stories, if you haven't noticed. Um, so a lot of times, they'll try to work out their problems in their stories, whether it's trying to figure out why somebody's being mean to somebody else or which dog stole which other dog's toy. Uh, sometimes they get a little more serious. Um, one of my favorite students was talking about nuclear waste the other day, and uh, one of my favorite quotes came out of his story, which should be popping up behind me in a second. Um, but regardless of how serious a problem, <laughs> regardless of how serious a problem is that the kids are writing about, this gives them a chance to practice finding a solution. This gives them a chance to try new things and maybe they say, oh, this one particular solution doesn't give me what I want for this character. This doesn't actually give me the outcome I was expecting. So, Let's try something new, which leads us to the growth mindset. The growth mindset is in direct opposition to what most of us probably grew up with, which is a fixed mindset. Fixed mindset says, I failed. That's it. I'm done. Uh, I have a certain set of skills. I have a certain set of talents that I am born with, and I can't do any better than that. Uh, I'm no good at math. I'm no good at acting. I'm no good at public speaking, whatever it is. The growth mindset, however, wants the kids to view failure as an opportunity. You try something new. You try it again. You keep going. Thankfully, video games really help with this because you just keep going after that boss till you find the right combination, right? So with the growth mindset, it allows them to try these new solutions. It allows them to try new perspectives on their characters, try new villains, try new sidekicks. See what happens in your stories. We really like to emphasize creative editing when it comes time to look at their stories. We try weird things like cutting apart our papers and taping them back together uh, into one giant scroll so you're looking at things in a completely different perspective. Uh, all of these things really help them start to dig in and find out what makes the stories tick. So this really helps them in the future when they're looking at jobs, when they're looking at stuff in their schoolwork, to say, hey, it didn't work. I got the wrong answer. Well, what the math teacher thinks is the wrong answer, I still think it's the right answer, but how do I fix this? So, in summary, and it wouldn't be complete if I didn't give you homework, so if you haven't participated in the Matrix downstairs, I'd love for you to go put your favorite books on the Matrix so we have a really good representation of everybody here. And there's a slip of paper with a lot of resources, including downloadable worksheets to start writing your own stories. And uh, I really want you to get out there, dig out that story you thought you'd never write, start working your worksheets, and one of these days, I look forward to reading it myself. Thank you very much. Best takeaway is growth mindset. I was like, I'm writing that down. Is that a real thing or did I just steal it from you? I have to Google it later, but I like that. That was, I'm gonna use that tomorrow at work. Um, I'm really excited. This is our sixth talk, which means it's the last thing between you know us and intermission. And I'll tell you more about intermission, but get very excited for this. Uh, I know I am. I had a chance to sit in rehearsal, so I kind of know when the energy should rise. So let it rise. Uh, help me welcome. Um, we have the next talk, Saving the Planet with Your Fork from Mary Purdy. We were warned over a year ago by the United Nations that if we did not reduce our carbon emissions by 45% by the year 2030, we would be in for a world of chaos and catastrophe. That means more droughts, more floods, 
air that we cannot breathe, soil and land that we can't use, and ultimately a shortage of resources that we all need to survive, like food and water. And things could get ugly. But I'm not here to bring you down. I'm here to lift your spirits. Look at these cute kittens. <laughs> the fact is that we still have time to do something about climate change, but it will require effort. And that, my friends, is where you all come in. What you don't know is that a quarter of our greenhouse gases come from our food system. That is how we grow, transport, produce, consume, and waste food every single day. But this is good news, because we all eat every single day, sometimes several times a day, if we're lucky. And while I know the choice is not there for everybody, for most of you, it is. And what you choose to eat or not eat makes a difference. I can feel some of you getting nervous. <laughs> Here's the deal. I am a dietitian nutritionist, and whenever people come to see me, they're always nervous. I'm going to take away their bacon and their chocolate and their coffee, but that's not how I work. I don't start by taking away. I start by adding in, like collards to your bacon and cinnamon to your coffee and berries to your chocolate. So much easier, right? So I'm imagining that you all have come to see me for a nutritional counseling session sent by your doctor, Mother Earth, for your current condition, climate change. Welcome, so glad you're here, have a seat. Now, maybe you're that person who's in denial. You're just, it's too scary to think about. I understand. Or maybe you're like, I'm not changing my diet, I like things the way they are. I get it. Or maybe you're thinking, gosh, there's something I could do, yes. I got four ideas. Number one, we consume a huge amount of animal protein in this country. It contributes to 15% of our greenhouse gases. That is because of cow burps, because of pollution, and because we are deforesting lands to grow feed for our animals. But you don't have to be vegan. You can if you want to, but you don't have to be. <laughs> Look how much that squirrel's enjoying those nuts over there, right? This is just about replacing some of your meat proteins with plant proteins. And look all these great foods you get to have, a little hummus, some lentil soup, edamame. And if you love the taste of meat, then just combine beef with beans and make yourself a chili. Point number two. We waste a third of the food that we produce in this country, which contributes to 8% of our greenhouse gases. Now, this is because we let it rot in our fridge, farmers can't sell it, restaurants throw it away, but you can buy produce that is less than perfect. And you can buy produce that lasts longer in your fridge, like cabbage and carrots. And when those carrots start to wilt, throw them in a soup. And that best before label, it is just an estimate by the food company about the time they think the food will taste best. Whew, this is a lot of information. Let's pause, take a breath, look at some cute pictures of more animals. <sighs> and just know that all the animals behind me are either endangered or extinct. Moving on. We throw away thousands of plastic bottles and coffee cups every day. This is similar to the emissions from a coal, 200 coal-powered plants. But you have options, you guys. You can purchase cool metal and glass containers and reuse them. And for God's sake, you can bring your own damn coffee mug to the local coffee shop and carry that thing out of there like a proud citizen. Thank you. The average meal travels 1,500 fossil-fueled miles to get to your plate. So instead of buying that apple from New Zealand, you get to have a Washington State-grown gala apple. And support your local and organic bakery instead of buying bread from the East Coast. In summary, make some chili. <laughs> Buy a funny-looking cucumber. Reuse your containers and support sustainable agriculture. And remember, you can use that bamboo fork that you just purchased to call your representatives. Because <laughs> while individual change is awesome, systemic change is gonna be what makes the difference. Thank you. I told you.
<laughs> Un unplanned, I have the ingredients to make chili this weekend. True story, I'll tag you when I make it, so props. I'm on it, I'm on the mission. Who's on the mission? Uh, yeah. Awesome, so we've made it through the first half of Ignite, so props to you guys, thanks for being awesome. A couple of announcements. Number one, go ahead and get your ticket for the next Ignite. It's 20% off if you purchase today. So the next Ignite is on February 27th in 2020, which is like crazy to imagine. That year is very close to us. Um, so make sure you grab your ticket. And then we're gonna make sure, you know, our, we have a group here in the back called Real Girls, and it's an awesome local nonprofit that works with uh, women and non-gender conforming people to really get into the film industry. It's really focused on making sure that women get behind the camera and not so much in front of it all the time, but learn behind the camera, learn the business. And so if you're on live stream, you get to play a fun interactive game with Real Girls right now. If you're in this room, race to happy hour, uh, or intermission, it's just downstairs for 20 to 25 minutes. You can grab a drink. Also, if two to three people are really, really into Jeopardy, which is what real girls will be doing in the back, you can go join them, but they only want two to three. So if you move as fast as her, there might be drink tickets. So please make sure you're back in your seats in about 20 minutes, and we'll get started with part two. Thank you, guys. My name is Lily Wilner, and we are back from our Ignite location in the back of the town hall. 
I just want to make a quick thank you uh, to Carlos Dillard, Fo Shang Su, Nadine Corey, Ashley McGirt, Rebecca A. Demarest, and Mary Purdy for giving such wonderful talks. I, for one, am excited to go home and learn about what I can be doing with my fork to help combat climate change. Um, very quickly, I want to talk to you about what Ignite is. It's an event that happens three to four times a year. Um, that people are able to tell fascinating stories about their hobbies and their passions within five minutes to a crowd that is so supportive and so excited to be here. Uh, I, for one, am also excited to have Melissa here to talk about her upcoming speech. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Great, we're so happy to have you here. Um, so my first question to you is, why were you interested in participating in Ignite 40? Oh, God. I mean, it's it's such a TED Talk opportunity in a way. And I'm a storyteller here in Seattle. And when it came around, this, this topic that I'm going to be handling is very personal. And I had told it at a storytelling event at Fresh Ground Stories the first time. And it kind of got some attention. And so when it came up, I thought, you know what? This is an important topic. And I want to... I want to share it. <laughs> and I'm so happy that you are going to share it. Um, my next question is, what do you hope the audience will take away from your speech? Well, my talk is about OCD, the obsessive compulsion disorder. And what I'm really hoping is that when people walk away, that they have a deeper understanding at how really difficult it is for some people with OCD. Some people kind of think it's funny, you know, and they make fun of it, and they're not quite clear on it. So I think that after tonight, they may realize it's 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 a tough it's a tough haul yeah I hope so um, so tonight like you said you're going to be talking about your experience with OCD as well as touching on some of your family's experiences what is something that you wish that people with OCD's peers and teachers knew about it well it's interesting because now in hindsight it's like there are early signs that you don't even realize that that's an early indicator. So for me, it started when I was nine years old. I went through this confession stage. I was confessing everything to my father. And he's like, what is with you? And then it just started kind of picking up. And then I started checking things and, and checking lights. And then I had, you know, my own obsession, which I'll go over in my talk. And it just started getting intense. And I think that in the classroom, especially with students, um, there's a lot of stress and anxiety going on. And, and when it's really bad, I mean, these kids can't even do homework because OCD can be absolutely stopping them from even being able to read a book or to be able to write or to be able to type. And homework can be absolutely daunting. And so they get behind, they're late, and some teachers don't understand. And they get a little frustrated. They're thinking that maybe the child is just kind of slacking off when, no, it could possibly be very much that the child is, you know, in, in a prison within their own mind. And it, it wreaks havoc on their daily living. Definitely, definitely. Um, another quick question. How did you prepare for tonight? I lived it. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> How long have you been practicing your speech? Well, like I said, it started off with a story that uh, came up this summer. But then the challenge is, is that it's five minutes exactly with 20 slides rotating automatically for 15 seconds. And I just thought, well, that sounds kind of fun. And so um, I really enjoyed the format because the hardest part, well, first off, finding you, you know, you have your talk and then finding the images that are going to portray what you're trying to say with your words. Um, that was awesome. That was really, really fun. Um, and then just practicing. So you have to be very tight with everything that you're going to say because that slide's going to change. So you really have to know, like almost like a, like it's a song, and you have to know the beats and the measures. And I've really enjoyed it. In fact, I have a talk tomorrow for another organization with a different talk, and I'm using the same format. I'm like, I've got 25 slides, and they're 20 seconds long. <laughs> but I don't have to deal with a clicker. So, so it's been really a really fun experience. And um, yeah, and then just rehearsal. You just rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay, well it sounds like you and I might have very different definitions of fun, but that's totally fine. <laughs> um, and then I also wanted to ask you, what do you think is one of the most common misconceptions about OCD? I know you were talking about people thinking it's more lighthearted or something to joke about, but if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Well, like any kind of mental illness, when you don't understand it, and I did this as, a, as the parent, you'd be like, come on, just snap out of it. You know, come on, you don't need to do that. Oh, just stop, we're in a hurry, come on. And, and you don't really realize like the torture that can be going on in the OCD patient's mind. And it's not something where you can just turn it off. It's like, you just can't turn off, you know, depression. You can't turn off asthma. You can't turn, well, that's not a mental, but you know, you can't turn these things off. And so learning to be empathetic, and there's times it really tests you. You know, it's hard for the whole family, but then when it starts to turn and it starts to like get better, because the good news is it's manageable. It's one of the fewer mental health you know, disorders where you can, once you learn some tools, therapy and sometimes with patients, therapy and prescription medicines as a balance, along with you know, behavioral cognitive therapies, it can work. And so in this talk, it's about exposure therapy. And it was the only thing that worked and we tried for four years. And so Seattle Children's Hospital pretty much saved our families life and happiness. <laughs> yeah. But we're still, the thing is though, it's an ongoing. So you get the tools, but then when transition happens, and that's another thing, like at the beginning of the school year, the student could be freaking out because it's a new school or it's a new class or it's a new this, that can trigger it. And so having the tools to be able to, okay, I'm not gonna let OCD get in my way, and you practice some of the things you'll learn about in my talk. It's good. Great. And then last question, how do you plan on celebrating after you finish your talk? After I finish? Oh, I'm going downstairs with my friends and I'm going to take pictures with people and I'm sure talk to people who might be relating to what I'm talking about. And yeah, yay, it'll be fun. This has been great. Yeah, it sounds great. I'm so excited for you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come talk to us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Go, girl. <laughs> All right, next we have a video that we're gonna queue up about Barbara Earl Thomas. She's a local artist and I'm so excited for you to see it. It's produced by Real Girls Productions. Here it is. My inspiration is um, what's happening in the world. And so right now I'm working on a, um, you know, a series that has to do with actually with the violence that's in our culture, especially around black men. I am trying to think about that and figure out how that manifests itself in my work. Because if I can say one thing about art, it's about being brave. It's about being willing to fail. How can I, as, as my life as an example, show that I can have differences with people, I cannot agree, and still there's enough ground for us both to stand on. That's what I think art has a possibility of doing, is transforming how people problem solve. How do we de determine the shows that are gonna happen at the Northwest African American Museum? That really comes as a function of our mission and vision. And the mission and vision of the, of the Northwest African American Museum, which is not my mission and vision, but one that has come from the community itself. And people decided that they wanted a museum that told the stories of African Americans who come from work and live in the Northwest. In some way, we have to come up with a link to how it helps us tell the stories. And I think that the museum is an example of community dreaming, of community manifesting a dream through a lot of hard work. We as human beings have the possibility of making something where there was nothing and that if you can imagine something, if you can dream about it, and if you can visualize it clear enough, then it's possible for you to make a thing. I'm a storyteller, a recycler of memory and everyday acts, dinner, reading, fishing, sex, bedtime, birth, love, death. I reshape the common experience and give it back in image and word. I'm a book lover, and the word is the sound of the idea of the thing named. In the reading room, 
You're in the reading room. The trumpet sounds. The cock crows. Fish hatch. Waters rise. Houses flood. Winds blow. And I'm damned and redeemed every day. Hello and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that video produced by Real Girls Productions. Now we're gonna jump into a quick game of Jeopardy based on the speeches that we've already heard tonight. I would like to introduce Al, contestant one, and Chaz, contestant two. Uh, we'll start with Al. Please pick one of our beautiful categories and then a point amount. Uh, I think I'll go. Oh, I'll grab it for you. You want to do facts and figures for 400. All right, the average American claims they have this many friends when they actually only spend time with five. Um, I believe I, I believe it was like 10 or something, 15. 10, 10 15, 10, all right. 10, 10, 10 or 15, what are we doing? Uh, hmm. I'm going, I'm going 10. 10, all right. Well, the answer was actually 16, but that's very close, very close. You uh, did a good job. That's good. All right, Chaz, what about you? What would you like to pick? Um, can I do proper nouns for 200? You definitely can. Woo. All right, what was the TV show that Carlos was on? I believe it's Divorce Court. That is correct. Divorce Court is the right answer. All right, back over to you, Al. Uh, I think I'm going to do uh, title of... All right, the title of Nadine's talk. Which one was that on? Nadine was the one about friendship. Friendship. Um, I like your shoes. Let's be friends. Very close. I like your shoes. Want to be friends. Yes, we'll give it to you. Yes. yes. Woo! All right. <laughs> Chaz, back to you. Uh, let's go with names and titles for 400. Names and titles for 400. All right, the title of Ashley's talk. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, if I give you a hint, it would be the one where the slides, the slideshow was not exactly what she was expecting. Uh oh, dying black. Exactly right, yes, definitely. All right, Al, last one. Huh. Gotta go big, sorry. Gotta go big, let's do it. Facts and figures. The fraction of food produced that is wasted. That was in the last talk, so it should be pretty memorable. Okay, um, I believe one third. Yes, exactly right. One third of the food produced in our country is wasted. Ooh, bummer. All right, Chaz, your turn. I'll do a potpourri for a thousand. Potpourri for a thousand. Playing big, I like it. A social behavior that kids do when they make friends. Now, Nadine listed three. You only need to list one. Uh, compliment each other. Yes, giving each other compliments is one of the correct answers. I'm going to confer with our scoreboard. Uh, what are we at? It looks like it's a tie. Time for the lightning round. All right. We're going to do it. Go ahead. Last question. Okay. What do you want to do? How much do I need to win? Anything? Go big. Okay. Uh, let's go this one. All right. Names and titles. The title of Mary's talk. Who's? Uh, which one was Mary's? Mary's was the last one. Um. Uh, shoot. Uh. Give me a tiny hint. It has to do with food waste. Your food waste, yes, exactly. Drawing um, a blank. All right. We're going to come back to you on that one. Chaz, what's your last one? Um, I'll go with proper nouns for a thousand. All right, proper nouns for a thousand. The organization that the BFI stands for The Brewery of Fearless Ideas. Woo, exactly right. And I want to circle back, Al, the answer. The answer we were looking for was saving the planet with your fork. Thank you guys so much for playing. I had so much fun. I hope you guys did too. And it seems like you guys learned a lot about the speeches, which is awesome. Um, and for you, Chaz, we actually have a small prize. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> 
Uh, just give us one second on that one. I, I just want to ask, uh, what was your favorite speech, Al? Um, I really liked the um the first one. It was the first one really spoke to me. Uh, personally, I actually um I I was bullied last year, so I can kind of kind of relate to that because whenever I get left out of something, I kind of bring back memories. Oh yeah. From last year. Sure. Really. What about you, Chaz? What was your favorite? Uh, I really liked the one about science and religion. Yeah, that was very interesting. I can agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. I'm going to wrap it up. This has been Lily Wilner from Real Girls. I had so much fun playing Jeopardy with you guys. Hope you enjoyed the rest of the night, okay? Thank you. All yeah, right. thank you. Up next, we have six more wonderful speakers for you to hear from with an array of wonderful talks that I'm sure will be incredibly fascinating. Uh, and it looks like that's it. Have a good one.
Hello, welcome back. Woo yeah, I like it. Do you wish when you woke up and you put your feet on the floor, you walked to the bathroom, someone was in there like, yeah, you got up on time. That would get me, that would get me going a lot faster in the mornings. Um, did anybody have a chance to visit the auto bar? It's downstairs. Hopefully you remember where that is. You'll be going back there after the show. Um, you may have noticed in the first half, we had a little bit of a technical challenge um, with the slides. And so at some point here in the second half, we want to give Ashley McGurt an opportunity to give her talk again. We've confirmed. Yeah. We're excited about that. We've confirmed we have the right uh, material. So just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to experience you know, how she prepared and what she came to do. So thank you guys for being an awesome crowd and agreeing to have seven talks in this half. So that's a bonus just for you. Uh, one, one thing that's pretty cool about Ignite is that there's a podcast. And so you get to do a fun interactive activity. You have a cell phone. Let me see it. Like we're in a concert. If there's a light on. I want to see the lights. Yeah, yeah. I never did this before. And I'm very excited for this moment. Okay. Now, put it down, whatever you do to listen to podcasts, please download the Ignite Seattle podcast. Cool thing, I have an episode on there. And what's cool about this podcast is it's an opportunity to hear more after you hear an Ignite talk from a speaker that you enjoyed, someone whose topic you found interesting. You then get to hear an interview with them and the host as they kind of unpack, like, you know, where did that story come from? What caused it? Um, I think the host for me, he's not from America. Um, I don't even know if he knows basketball. And he was just like, what are Jays? I was listening to that, but I don't know what that means. So that's kind of where we started. Uh, so if you're interested in learning what Jays are, look for my episode. But super excited that we have this Ignite Seattle podcast. And there'll be a new season coming out here this month, later in October. So Make sure you download and tune in, and it's a good way to get to know more about the speakers who participate. You may hear some folks from this Ignite um, coming up soon. So thank you guys for participating and doing the podcast. Awesome technology. Props for that. <laughs> Woo! And the best part about intermission is, like, kicking it off in part two. So we want to keep the energy high, so we're going to jump right into part two. Very excited to bring up... Um, Urban Wildlife Gardening. So help me welcome Understanding Israel. Hello, Seattle. Hello, Seattle. And thank you for your urban gardens, habitats for wildlife. But did you know that you've been the habitat for another wildlife? Cults. That's me in my favorite cult, the Love Family. In 1968, we're like, man, you don't have to go to Nam. Come up to the top of Queen Anne Hill. We're building the Love Family. What could go wrong with that? <laughs> well, we went out to the country and we shared outhouses, yurts. And one day I said, I'm not a conservative anymore. I'm a liberal, a flaming liberal and I'm living in a commune, a commune with values. We are one, that sounds good. Love's the answer, yes, now's the time. Well, why not? <laughs> and, and then I got a call from my mom. Hello? Hello, have you seen, Nash have Na have you seen the National Enquirer? No. Well, you're not in a commune, you're in a cult. I am? Yes, and you better get the heck out of there. Or you're going to be an old lady by the river with nothing. <laughs> you were right, Mom. <laughs> and in 1968, we broke up, and everybody blamed the leader. But I'm blaming the times. Because I remember the 60s like it was yesterday. There was a lot of happy people, and peace was the way. And we all went to Washington and we marched for civil rights. And then they killed King and our world turned to night. And we bowed our head and we prayed for a better day. And when we opened our eyes, whoa, 
70s was the way. <laughs> and we were still marching, joined arm in arm, and all of us were yelling, get out of Vietnam. And then it was over, gone in a flash. Hey man, I need some cash. And along came Reagan, and the A's were in, and smoking of the herb, it was a sin. Well, it's almost 2020, and elections are on trend, and I don't need taxes, I need dentures and depends. <laughs> so that's me, 40 years ago with our children, and four months ago with the children of the children, one of whom is here tonight. And he's going to sing for you one of our anthems by a young man named Integrity that speaks to our vision. Please welcome Seattle video producer, New Israel. We're gonna start ourselves a brand new country A beautiful place where we don't need no money We got good clean water, wine and milk and honey, yeah Don't you want to come along? Don't you want to sing this song? Don't you want to come along with me? Let the people say, I believe in love. Let the people say, we are one, we are one. Let the children sing and shout. Show everybody what it's all about. I sing it. Ah, la, 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 la. Ah, la, 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 la. Ah, la, 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 la. Thank you, New Israel. Well, we failed as a cult. How bad is that? But to keep a family together, it's not money, it's not technology. Love is the greatest power, and now is the time. Thank you, Seattle. That is so awesome. <laughs> I don't know if it was about urban wildlife gardens. I, I have some follow-up questions for her. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that was just very cool. How many people in here are not from Seattle, like you moved here from somewhere else? That was a very good history lesson. I will be Googling that. Um, love is real. I'm like, I just learned a lot just now. I'm very... I'm the most curious about her. Um, so <laughs> we'll, we'll make the transition. That was incredible. Uh, we have an awesome talk coming up about turning orphanages into creative hubs. Please help me welcome Simon Okalo. Many of you here tonight are good people. You love giving to great causes, especially in a place like Africa, where good people like you and aid has caused the biggest amount of societal damage and brain drain that I'm determined to reverse by turning orphanage homes into creative hubs in order to change the narrative about Africa. I moved to Seattle in June 2010 and I've done all sorts of jobs that an immigrant is expected to do. On May 17th, 2019, I resigned from my day job and decided to focus on being a full-time dad. And to three beautiful girls, my wife is over there. Thank you for coming. Um, 
And I also decided to focus on running One Vibe Africa, which is an organization that I founded. And, you know, this is an organization that was started in Manyata, which is the third largest slum in Kisumu, Kenya, which is the third largest city uh, in Kenya. And so, growing up in Manyata in an orphanage home that was started by my mother, the orphanage home was called Young Generation Center. Uh, we were a community of people that were totally dependent on aid. You know, we would wait for people to bring us food. We would wait for people for, to provide education for us. And we became so dependent on aid that it was difficult to break off of that chain. And so, you know, imagine Young Generation Center, an institution that from 1997 when it was started to 2013 when we turned it into a creative hub, you know, it served hundreds of kids uh, until 2013. But between 2013 and 2019, it has served over 2,000 youths because we are now a place of solace, not a place of sorrow. You know, a place where music and creativity and filmmaking is the order of the day. So, you know, we've reached over 12 million people digitally through the content and the events that we are creating. We've, uh, you know, created over 20 jobs in Kenya. We've worked with over, you know, 300 volunteers here in Seattle. And this is just, um, you know, a tip of the iceberg. And it just shows you what a group of determined people can do over the last 13 years. And so, how did we get here? Why do Africans need uh, genuine people to collaborate and work together with? Well, Africa's resources have been siphoned out of the continent uh, for over 500 years. In 1973, Walter Rodney said that, you know, Africa helps develop uh, the West with the same proportion that the West underdevelops Africa. Recent studies show that uh, about $133 billion is sent to Africa in form of aid. And about uh, $218 billion is siphoned out of Africa in form of illegal mining, uh, poaching, brain drain. And so Africa has a net deficit, a loss of about $85 billion every year. And so this suggests that Africa actually aids the West. So this brings us to a situation where we have to figure out how do we move on from here. And so for me, my determination is to collaborate with people that also understand that Africa actually gives to the world. You know, uh, the Congo alone ensures that all of us have cell phones here. You know, there's a product called Cobalt that is the primary ingredient in all the cell phones. So without the Congo, we would have no cell phones. So with that, I just want to say that our work has been made possible by people that understand that, you know, the same passion that we are putting into climate change should be put into, uh, you know, reversing the effects of aid. And so with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, awesome talk. Uh, we have the opportunity to learn a lot here tonight, and so I think that was a great way to kind of bring it global for us. Uh, now we're gonna learn about something that maybe you've heard of before, and you're gonna kind of be introduced to it in a different way. So up next we have a talk called OCD is a Family Affair by Melissa Reeves. Let's give her a round of applause. I'm 13 years old and I'm washing my hands for the 20th time. I've checked the lights in the oven at least a dozen times because I've been swearing at God all day and I'm scared something bad is gonna happen. I am an undiagnosed obsessive compulsion disordered patient and I am going to struggle with this well into my 20s. And now my daughter, that same OCD monster that wormed its way into my thoughts is now worming itself into hers and she is down. And we have tried everything for years and nothing's working. And there were times that not only did we feel helpless, but we felt hopeless. OCD affects about 1% of the population. That's, in America, 3.2 million people who suffer from this. There's probably a dozen people in this room who understand what I'm talking about. And some people think it's funny. They're like, oh, you have OCD? Will you come over and clean my house? 
No. These thoughts are intrusive and they're scary. They're, they're, they're about death and destruction and, and self-harm or harm to others. And the compulsions or the rituals are designed to stop them. So counting and chanting and, and, and hoarding and cleaning, they're all designed to stop it. We finally found out that Children's Hospital has a program for teens with extreme levels of OCD. It meets four days a week, three hours a day, and then two hours every day with homework. And when you get there, they tell you right away, hey, okay, you're going to be riding a wave, and thoughts are not actions. And when OCD says to do something, you do the opposite. And you're going to become best friends with your OCD detective. We're like, okay. And then they'd ask you, when we do an exposure, tell us what your suds are. If it's okay and cool, you can do it with a one, that's great. But if it's gonna make your head blow off, that's a 10, you gotta let us know. And so right away we started with teeth brushing because she had a fear of chemicals and death, so that had become an issue, it was not happening. And so right away, she's a 10. And then she's an eight and then a seven. And by the end of the first week, she is brushing her teeth twice a day. For homework. And then as she gets stronger, they just put a bottle of chemicals next to her and she's like, 10, 10, 10, oh, 6, 5, and it got better. And then she got stronger and while she's brushing her teeth, now they're like, psh, psh, psh. she's like, 10, 10. Uh, and she's noticing that no one is dying. So maybe OCD lies. And then they spray her hands and they put Doritos in them, and they say, eat. What? Eat. So she does, and then we all start eating out of her phalanges of death. <laughs> and on the ride home, she wasn't at a 10, she was at a 10,000. And she wailed, that kind of guttural cry that I used to, you know, the kind that comes up from your toes, and as it's coming up, it's scraping off years of tar, of self-doubt and fears, because you're just so sick of arguing with it. But I can't say anything. They've taught me that every time I reassure her and I say, oh, baby, it's okay, no one's gonna die, you're fine. I'm throwing a bone to her OCD monster. So I just have to sit there with her and ride that wave while she's negotiating with her OCD detective. And it's telling her, you gotta dump this toxic friend. It's lying to you, and we've shown you over and over again, and you gotta get rid of it. But like any toxic friend, it fights back. It says, oh, you don't mean that. No, we do everything together. I built you. Without me, you'd be nothing. So shut up and count. Because if you don't count, there will be a school shooting, or a plane crash, or you or someone you love will die. So shut up and count! She stares at the bag of chips, because she's got to eat them again without washing her hands. And she rips that bag open, and she says, screw you, OCD! And that's when I knew she was going to make it, that she'd turn the corner, that finally we have some tools that can help us and her. And we still have to do exposure work. It's not over. It's an ongoing thing to manage. But she has it. And that kid that I saw strapped down and couldn't move in April is now standing strong and facing every fear she's ever had because now she is an OCD warrior. <sighs> Thank you. And all like exhale. <laughs> Powerful. I learned a lot. Um, I've had a chance to process that a couple times, but very personal sharing. And that is really that emotional ride you just went on. That is storytelling at its finest. So thank you so much for doing that for us. <laughs> Secret my bedtime is 10 p.m. So what you're seeing is like, oh, she getting sleepy? No, 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 we're still here, we're still alive. So high energy's back up, let's make some noise. Yeah! 
All right, so our next talk is really about perception bias. So how to see your own perception bias. We have Ava Black. Let's welcome them on up. Woo -woo. So when I was in seventh grade, I was one of the girls. And we all sat around the quad and braided our hair and talked about how boys were gross. And well, the boys, the older ones, they knew this about me too. They bullied me for it. So by the time I reached high school, I figured out that looking like a boy made me safe. And 10 years into my career in tech, I learned how to be one of the guys. And well, my career took off. And I was flying around the world talking on stages like this, from Berlin to Tokyo, meeting with executives on the beach of Tel Aviv. And that privilege gave me confidence enough to feel safe and shed old armors, and I came out as trans for my birthday a few years back. And I lost my job. And, uh, well, that's the first time as an adult that I was sexually assaulted. So the privilege evaporated, and its absence was palpable in the halls of those tech conferences that I had been going to, where job offers had been thrown at me. Suddenly, I couldn't get hired anywhere. I had one manager say to me, I just don't know how to hire someone like you. So this talk is about bias, and I have news for you. You're all biased, but it's okay. So am I. It's inherent in the human condition. What matters is what we do with that bias, and the trick about it is it's really hard to see your own bias, especially when your community shares it. Now, I am defining perception bias as the impact of our past experiences on the vehicle through which we experience the world. You may have heard the phrase, that person is seeing through rose-colored glasses. We say this about someone when we think they're in love or in infatuation because we know that their, their judgment, their perception of somebody else is affected by their desire, their hormones, and it's temporary. Now, the tool that has helped me the most to see my bias is meditation, which I learned as a little kid growing up in India. And ever since then, I've engaged a practice of observing the arising of thoughts, feelings, and memories in the container that is my mind. And by paying special attention to the conditions that alter the color of those thoughts, one can become aware of bias in real time and say, oh, right now, my judgment of this person is affected by some old memory that has nothing to do with them. Observing this with equanimity decreases its power over us. So I thought I knew what color my glasses were before I began to transition this body. And imagine my surprise to realize that the hormones here play a part in this too. When I shifted to an estrogen cycle, the world got brighter. It's no joke to say it's the best antidepressant I've ever taken. So I have colleagues from all over the world with different bodies and different origin stories. I think that diversity is beautiful, but I am afraid because our businesses are struggling to handle this much diversity. We're building tools for the sum of all humans, and we're getting it wrong. Artificial intelligence is fundamentally a bias amplification tool. An image classifier is only as diverse as the team that trained it. It goes kind of like this. Right now in the world, there's a team of people looking at pictures, tons of them, and labeling them. That's a cat, and that's a dog, and that's a woman, and that's a black man. And that, well, I don't know what gender it is, so I'm going to delete it. You see, they apply the labels in their mind and group things to improve the accuracy of their classifiers. 98% is an A+. But they forget those outliers and those 2% were people who are no longer represented. From some perspective, each one of us is an outlier. And artificial intelligence is already affecting every area of human life, from whether you get toilet paper in the restrooms in Beijing to your timeline to where the police patrol in America. We cannot code our way out of this problem because it isn't a code problem. It's a people problem. And if you want to help, you can start by learning to see your own bias. Move to a different culture, not just another country. Learn the language, become a local. If you can't actually move, read books. Find that community here in Seattle. We are more diverse than you think. 
and see how your perceptions change when you come back to the place you were familiar with. And also meditate. You don't have to find a quiet place to sit because you build the quiet inside yourself. Find a teacher or tradition and stick with it. It is hard to see yourself this much, but it is worth it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ava. I told you guys I'm a science geek. The other thing you should know is I'm a finance nerd. I, I studied finance. I got that degree in three years, and I was like, let's study something else. Um, so the title of this next talk gives me a lot of hype. Who in here knows what a p-value even is? Yes, 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 yes. OK, you guys are the people I want to hang out with at the after party. No one else. That's the test. Um, so super excited to introduce the next talk. Does this p-value make my lives look good? Come on up, Josh. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about bad science today. So for those of you who don't know what a p-value is, it's a scientific score. It goes from 0 to 100%. And if you're a scientist and your study gets a p-value of 5% or lower, your paper gets published. So great, right? <laughs> what it's really supposed to be is it's supposed to be a measure that nothing is happening. So imagine that you're working on a new cancer drug, right? Um, if you have a p-value of 5 or less that your cancer drug does nothing, then great, 95% chance that our cancer drug does something now we can help people cure, uh, cure cancer. And this is really important because we want to make sure that we're giving people drugs that work. We want to make sure that we're publishing things that meet a good standard, like I don't want to be publishing some crazy study saying hurricanes have genders or whatever. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, you guys are at Ignite, right? You want to hear that science is real and scientists never lie. This sort of thing can't really happen, right? Not really? Yeah. OK, so let's talk about how. If I'm an unscrupulous sort of scientist, one thing that I might want to do is I might study 20 different cancer drugs. And if I run this study 20 times, one of them, just through pure chance, is going to come up looking like it does something. And that's exactly what the scientists in this Hurricanes paper did. They took a public data set, and they ran 14 different statistical models on it. The 14th model pops up, oh, female hurricanes are deadlier than male hurricanes. But if you actually read the paper, the w process by which they're describing this happens makes no sense. What they're saying is that, like, women, women are cool, right? <laughs> if, if you hear about a hurricane coming by and it's got a cool name like Katrina, you're like, Katrina, come on in, no problem. But if you hear about a scary hurricane named Dennis or Stan, you buckle down, you get ready. So my first tip for you guys is when you uh, see one of these scientific, you know, science claims types articles, just ask how, how does it work? And the good news is, this, uh, this hurricane's paper, it didn't really cause any negative problems, but let me introduce you to some scientists. Uh, these are doctors Reinhardt and Rogoff. They were two, um, or are, two Harvard economists. And in 2009, in the wake of the financial crisis, they published a paper um, which claimed that the financial crisis was fundamentally different from other economic downturns. Normally, in an economic downturn, you want to increase government spending, but what they were saying was that this time is different. Instead, we need to slash budgets. In fact, that was the title of their book, This Time is Different. And as you might imagine, some uh, politicians, namely conservatives, were so excited when they saw this topic. They said, we want to slash budgets anyway, and now this is it. This is our time to slash those budgets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see a lot of you recognize this is Paul Ryan. He was running for vice president in 2012, and during his campaign, he would frequently cite this Reinhardt Rogoff paper. And although he didn't win, a lot of politicians who were running for office around the same time did win, especially in Europe, and they proceeded to do exactly what Reinhardt and Rogoff had suggested. They went around slashing budgets. But you guys were listening to the first half of my talk, right? You know to ask how, so 
oh, Reinhardt and Rogoff told us it was a secret. Their model was too good for them to release their methods. <laughs> yeah. So, while that was going on, countries like Greece were busy following their advice and noticing that their economies were tanking and continued to have problems for a long time. And it wasn't until 2013 that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff finally released their methodology. And do you know what it was? It was a very simple Excel model. The sort of thing that almost anybody in this room, I'm certain, could have put together. And not only that, there was a basic error in the model, which was caught within a week. A grad student published a paper refuting their core finding. And so that brings me to my final point. Secrets are not science. Because if secrets are science, yeah, I'm a scientist. I can tell you that 95% of these slides don't cause cancer. And where does that leave us? Thank you. I told you science was fun. That's hilarious. That was really great. Um, all right. Remember, we talked earlier. We had Ashley. We we're going to redo that talk, so now's the time. Uh, so again, welcome her. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Diane Black. I'm back. <laughs> All I got to do is stay black and die. Langston Hughes, necessity. Just stay black and die, Maya Angelou. All I got to do is stay black and die, Dolores Constance McDowell. I call her grandmother. I can hear her say this phrase clear as day. I vividly remember sitting on my grandmother's couch and watching Lean On Me and hearing Joe Clark, played by Morgan Freeman, say, just stay black and die. And when I think about this phrase, I reflect back on my own family and so many other black families and even non-black who refuse to do the things that they need to do that can prolong their life. Now, some of us may hear a silly slogan or mantra but in my work, I have realized how just staying black and dying is really leading us to our graves quicker. We are not living well. We are sick. Many of you in this room, like me, have been sick, but still got up and went to work, went to school, took care of your kids, because you didn't have time to be sick. As a hospice clinician, I have the extreme honor of sitting at the bedside of those who begin to transition out of this world. And in watching those who begin to die, I have noticed we are not dying well. Black people especially are not dying well. African Americans are more likely to die at all ages from all causes, no matter what the disease, cancer, even suicide. It's the third leading cause of death for black males aged 15 to 24. I'm on a mission to change that. So through the use of therapy, which is just one tool, there's many tools that we can use from eating well, exercise, dieting, but as a licensed mental health therapist, I know the power of therapy. I've seen it every day. Even with my hospice patients who have been on their last breath, I've noticed that as they work through their unprocessed trauma, trauma that's been stored in their bodies, manifesting itself through somatic symptoms, you know, those somatic experiences, that headache that just won't go away, that neck pain, that stress, that stress that is really killing us, no matter what your race, but is really impacting those who look like me. I know this firsthand. So I really want you to do your part. Because when we think about mental illness, Aside from suicide related to depression, we don't typically think that it can kill us. We also fail to recognize the correlation of mortality rates to racism. The health deficit for blacks in America can literally be chased back to American chattel slavery, Jim Crow, to present day, where black lives don't matter, so we need a hashtag to prove that it does. We can't even eat ice cream in our own living room without being killed. My own family. 
My Aunt Lynn was just 52 when she took her last breath. My Uncle Kenny, he was 54 when he died alone, traveling to another state in search of work and health insurance in an attempt to prevent the inevitable. I was probably one of the last people he texted before he took his last breath. My cousin, Aaron Montgomery, was just 34 when he died. And the world mourned the loss of Hermius Nipsey Hussle, who was slain in the same way so many black boys who look like him have died. American actor John Singleton was just 51 when he died from a stroke. The same thing that killed my grandmother at 62. The leading cause for strokes is high blood pressure. High blood pressure is related to stress. See the correlation? Childhood trauma is especially insidious. Through adverse childhood experiences, or what we call ACEs, we can now measure the impact of childhood toxic stress, just like that of cholesterol. You get one point for each type of trauma. The higher your ACE score, the higher you're likely to have your life decreased by 20 years. Blacks all across the globe tend to have higher ACE scores. If I measured every one of you in this room, we would all have at least two. So I want you to know the power of therapy to heal from our trauma, because that trauma, while we're powering through and we're resilient people, it's taking place and storing itself in our body. We have to live well so we can die well. Follow me on Instagram, at Therapy with Ash. Yeah. This is the Ignite crowd, that's so awesome. That's kind of the spirit, right? If it's nice, do it twice. I heard a woman say that about marriage once on a plane. <laughs> no joke, stranger next to me said that. Thank you so much, Ashley, for repeating that talk for us. That was, that was awesome. Uh, we have one more talk for us tonight, the closer. You know, it's the most important part um, of a movie, the closing scene. So we're going to jump right into it. You know, TSA is pretty tough. I travel a lot, and so I'm very excited for this. Uh, Confessions of an International Smuggler. Please welcome Angela Barris. I'd been visiting family in Canada, and I was attempting to get back home, but instead, I was stuck at the border. It turns out that what I was carrying was highly illegal contraband. I had no idea, I promise. It went something like this. I've been standing in line for ages. It was finally my turn. Sir, I just wanna give these to you. I gotta get back home to my family. But before I could run away, Ma'am, you don't seem to understand the severity of this crime. I could charge you $2,500 for every item you are trying to smuggle into the United States. $2,500? I had six of them. <laughs> That's $15,000. I've heard the... The, the fine for an ounce of heroin is only a thousand dollars, so I was so confused. Ma'am, just take these back to Canada, come back empty-handed, and I will allow you to leave fine-free this time. You're probably wondering, what was I smuggling? <laughs> it wasn't drugs, it wasn't weapons of mass destruction, it wasn't even kidnapped children. It was Kinder Eggs. That's my confession. Kinder eggs are sold, that over 30 billion of them in all civilized countries around the world, except the United States. They're made out of this delectable chocolate that surrounds a, a sealed capsule that has a collectible toy inside. Now these are not to be confused with the Kinder Joy. Those hit the American market a couple of years ago to try and pacify us. They are the worst imposters. Don't even buy them. Costco got it wrong. They're on their shelves right now. I go to leave, and I open the door, and a siren blasts, and border guards come running past me, and they surround a little red car about 30 feet away at gunpoint. 
I thought, that guy must have brought in way more Kinder Eggs than me. <laughs> I uh, went to open the door, or I waited. There was no, no shots, and I went to open the door. Get back in here, you over here now. I ran back into a corner. I crouched down with my new border hostage friends. You guys, this is what's keeping me stuck here. I just want to get home. Could you help me eat these? <laughs> well, before we could eat the evidence, border guard woman, don't you eat those eggs. They're illegal in the United States of America, and you're sitting on American soil. Don't you eat those eggs. Well, finally, they brought in a real criminal, and I was free to go. I ran across the street to Canada. I got rid of my Kinder Eggs as fast as I could, and then I turned to face the United States of America, land of the free. <laughs> free from Kinder Eggs. <laughs> I stepped out onto the crosswalk, and that's when a car came barreling around the building. He hadn't seen me. He was going so fast. Luckily, he stopped just in time, barely missing me. That's when I discovered that these cones you see along the street are actually human catapults. I hadn't seen it. I stepped on it. Now I'm airborne all fours in the air at the same time. It turns out there's another law at work at the border. Gravity. <laughs> I landed so hard, I lacerated my hands. I had whiplash, concussion. That's when it hit me. Kinder eggs are very, very dangerous <laughs> to Americans. That's my confession. I am a, a, a failed international candy smuggler. Now, if you're like me, you're probably wondering why on earth are Kinder Eggs illegal? I, I wondered the same thing, and I found this website. It's called Free the Egg. <laughs> and if you agree with me and, and millions of, of children from this height to this height who love Kinder Eggs and feel it needs to be freed, please sign the petition. How about if we give a call out to the Kinder Egg Seattle on the count of three? Let's just say free the egg. It, it, it would warm my heart. One, two, three. Free the egg! <laughs> Okay, <laughs> never in my life had I heard of a Kinder Egg, but is that a hard piece of plastic inside of a candy? That does seem hazardous. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I w I'm going to read more, but I want to have an educated conversation, but I can think of 10 risks right now <laughs> with a Kinder Egg, at least 10. Um, applaud yourselves. We have made it through Ignite. <laughs> woo -hoo! A couple of awesome announcements before we let you out of here. Thing one, tickets for the next Ignite are on sale now. You get 20% off if you purchase your ticket today. That'll happen on February 27th, 2020. So go ahead, get your tickets, get your savings. Those people are really excited for the happy hour. I can't wait to see you there. Uh, to clarify, the happy hour is downstairs in a proper bar. So it's not the counter um, service that we had out there, but it's actually downstairs in the basement. We call it, you know, okay, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Parties used to happen in the basement. That's when you knew they were dangerous and you shouldn't be there. So that's where we're going to go, to a party in the basement. All of our speakers will be there. It'll be a fun time to mix and mingle uh, with folks whose talks you found interesting. Learn more about New Israel. I'm coming, uh, and the Kinder Egg. So meet me downstairs. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Cheers, Ignite. <laughs>